I'm Aaron Porras. And I'm Nittany Manson. Coming up in today's newscast, Israel prepares for a possible war with Iran and its proxies. Meanwhile, the G7 countries look to make peace with the Iranian regime. And finally, an incredible new Israeli algorithm may just be the key to early di disease diagnosis. The drums of war continue to beat ever louder in Israel as both Iran and its Shiite proxy in Lebanon, Hezbollah, threaten reprisals. This after Israel's successful preemptive attack on Saturday against a terror cell preparing to launch an explosive UAV at Israel. Iran says that Israel will pay a high price for this strike, with the army assessing that, assessing that military rather than civilian targets are the most likely. And likewise, other neighboring countries are threatening counterattacks. But meanwhile, though no additional soldiers have yet been deployed to the north, soldiers along the northern border have been put on high alert. And in a Channel 12 report, an unnamed officer remarked that although the Army's assessment is that military installations would most likely be Hezbollah's targets, the IDF's response to any such attack would be disproportionate. A sentiment Prime Minister Netanyahu also echoed. <laughs> הוא יודע יפה מאוד שמדינת ישראל יודעת להגן על עצמה היטב ולהשיב לאויביה כגמולם. ואני רוצה להגיד לא, ולמדינת לבנון שמאחסנת את הארגון הזה ששואף להשמיד אותנו, ואני אומר את זה גם לקאסם סולימני, היזהרו בדבריכם ועוד יותר היזהרו במעשיכם. Additionally, in a call with United States Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu made it clear that Lebanon would be held responsible for attacks emanating from its soil, particularly from the south of the country, where Hezbollah retains a stranglehold. The biggest surprise, however, is how Netanyahu took the unusual step of requesting that political rival Benny Gantz be briefed by top military aides. The idea being that if blue and white wins in elections, Gantz as a new prime minister would need to be in the know. And this just highlights the severity of Israel's current security assessment all the more. And joining us now with the latest on the potential for war with Iran, please welcome Likud M.K. Yoav Kish, Chairman of the Interior Committee. Hi, hello. Hi, thank you so much for joining oh, us. My pleasure. All right, so we will just jump right in. Um, how likely do you think it is that the Iranian Hezbollah threats will turn to uh, reality? And if so, when can we expect that? Listen, we were on the edge of an active, aggressive uh, Iranian uh, um, mission against Israel, and Israel stopped it. And that was announced by Israel, and everybody saw it by uh, bombing the uh, Iran uh, villa that had few uh, drones that were already in purpose to target Israel, uh, I think, a few days ago. So we are on, in the middle of a uh, scenario when the Iran is trying to aggressively uh, hurt Israel. It's not only building the Iran power in Syria, uh, Lebanon, which they did with Hezbollah, and now in Syria and Iraq. Now they're actually trying to hurt Israel. And that's why we stopped them and we announced and let people know that Israel did it because they were targeting to hurt our, our civilians. So we are on the edge of a, a scenario like this. I do think that uh, Israel army and defense forces and together with the strategy that Benjamin Netanyahu is leading us, is putting us in a point that we could face this threat, stop it, and succeed in avoiding it. Okay, so coming back off of that same sentiment, if we're so close to war or already in a war, as you've suggested, why is it that Israel has yet to send reinforcements to the north? We know that they've sent a few troops uh, towards the north, but not really at the border. Listen, what have that have changed is that uh, we're not, not talking about Iranian forces in Syria. Now we're also talking about Hezbollah in Lebanon. Right. And Hezbollah in Lebanon uh, are claiming that uh, Israel attacked them. Uh, Israel did not officially recognize that, but uh, they are claiming that. And they, are, uh, they said that they want to hurt Israel. And they didn't say, of course, what. So in the case that they will try to uh, uh, be aggressive against Israel, Israel has to be ready. And that's the reasoning for enforcement in the north border. Right, but, but then why haven't they gone all the way to the border? Because we haven't yet seen those reinforcements. We are in a, you know, it's kind of a, 
I don't know, like a tango dance, you know, mm -hmm. they're making a step, we're making a step. It, no, none of the sites, by the way, not us, and I don't think that Hezbollah and the Lebanese government want, want to start a war. Nobody has it on his agenda. And if Hezbollah will cool down, stop its aggressiveness uh, uh, threats and so on, things will cool down. But if Hezbollah will do some aggressive action, then Israel needs to be prepared, and then Israel is going to react, react against Hezbollah, against Lebanon. Okay. So we are kind of uh, measuring until where and when should we move forward, and the same with their threats and discussions. So what exactly can Israel be doing uh, to protect against this, this northern threat? We're not planning an aggressive uh, move now against Hezbollah, but Israel is now making the needed preparations in case we'll have to do so. And we don't want to be starting the whole thing from scratch in that sense. We understand that there's a higher risk right now. We, we're not dealing right now with, uh, let's say, cross-the-border activities, but we're dealing with preparations within Israel. Is that maybe your same reaction to why Benny Gantz was just briefed uh, on, on the situation? Is that, do you feel like that situation might be necessary, that he, his briefing? Well, I think that to those of you who doesn't know Israeli politics that well, usually the head of the opposition is being briefed and he's, you know, he's part of the global, let's say, the, 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 the local atmosphere knowing the threats and what, what's the agenda, even though he's not in the coalition. Right now, since we ran to elections so fast, he's not in his official position of head of opposition, but we do regard him as that, as the leader of the largest party in the, in the Knesset. So, yes, this is a... Since we're in a time that things can heat up very fast, by the way, both on Gaza and in the north, sure. I think it's important that he's briefed and he would, you know, it's good for the unity and support of the whole country that he will be in the picture, right, as they say. To be aware. Yeah. yeah. Knesset right. member, thank you so much for coming in. Thank you very much. In related news, as Israel defends its actions in the north to the international community, one particular criticism is coming from an unlikely source. And specifically, the United States is now distancing itself from Israel over its alleged attacks against the Shiite militia in Iraq. In a statement from the Pentagon, spokesperson Jonathan R. Hoffman says the United States supports, quote, Iraqi sovereignty and has repeatedly spoken out against any potential actions by external actors inciting violence in Iraq. Though this comes after heavy Arab pressure was applied on Washington over the incident. The Fatah coalition, a strong bloc in Iraq's parliament for one, blamed the U.S. for Israel's strikes and called on America to withdraw its troops from Iraq in response. On the other hand, however, U.S. Vice President Mike Pence seemed to support Israel's actions during his phone call with Prime Minister Netanyahu on Monday, after which he tweeted that he'd had a great conversation with Netanyahu and that the U.S. fully supports Israel's right to defend itself from imminent threats. He did not elaborate on which, which threats, though, leaving the statement open to interpretation. But at any rate, Israel still maintains, as always, that it will do anything in its power to defend the country from Iranian encroachment, with Prime Minister and Defense Minister Benjamin Netanyahu also calling on the international community to act against Iran's hegemonic activities. Iran poelet bechazit rechava kedel ootzi at kafot terror atzchaniot neged medinat Israel. Israel tamshich laagen al bitchona bechol derech shetidaresh. Vani kore kan lakila ben lomit lifol miyad. Meanwhile, at the G7 summit in France, world leaders again appear to be trying to appease Iran and to say that Israel is worried with the new developments would be an understatement. Israel's concerns began to heighten after Iranian Foreign Minister Javad Zarif was invited unopposed by French President Macron to attend the summit in, Bi in Biarritz. And then they heightened again when European and even U.S. leaders at the conference continued to push a return of sorts to the 2015 JCPOA agreement. For example, German Chancellor Angela Merkel on Monday commented that the G7 had made a big step forward with Iran and in coordination with the United States, quote, which is big. Likewise, President Macron touted how great it was that Iran suggested it would be happy to return to negotiations with individuals who would help Iran with interests of the state. Even newly minted UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson said that there's an opportunity to bring Iran back into compliance with the JCPOA and cease its disruptive behavior in the region, while President Trump admitted that he'd be willing to meet with Iran's President Hassan Rouhani under the right circumstances. But then Rouhani, for his part, says that he'd be willing to meet with the United States as long as sanctions are lifted. Until then, he explains, Iran will continue as it sees fit. 
That's why, again, many argue that it would be a reward for Iran to have any sanctions removed at all, especially after Iran repeatedly broke the deal over the years to begin with. And finally, Israeli officials fear that a scenario in which talks with Iran results in the lifting of sanctions, but no change in behavior, similar to what's been seen with North Korea. Though that said, Iran's Foreign Minister Zarif later commented that such a meeting with the United States in general would be unthinkable, potentially ending any chance of a near-future discussion anyhow. Moving on, following three harrowing terror attacks in the West Bank over the past month, at least one major disaster seems to have been avoided Monday night. Because just days after a West Bank bombing left one Israeli civilian dead and two injured, Israeli security forces detected an improvised explosive device planted on the highway. The suspicious object was found along Route 555 Highway near Nablus, and sappers were able to deactivate the device with a robot. Additionally, in this case, thankfully, nobody was hurt. Very much unlike the weekend tragedy which struck the, the Schnurb family, where 17-year-old Rina was killed, while her brother and father were badly injured by an explosive near a natural spring. And security forces are still searching for the perpetrators of that deadly attack. Then, in a similar security success, the IDF busted a weapons factory in the West Bank town of Beit Likia, arresting eight suspects for engaging in terrorist activity in the process. But these incidents are just a few examples that back up the theory that a major violent incident may emerge from the West Bank prior to next month's elections. For example, as Amos Harel of Haaretz writes, the West Bank may become Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's biggest security challenge in the near future, as opposed to Iran, Lebanon, or Gaza. And this thanks, to, thanks in large part to the deterioration of the Palestinian Authority's economy and a standoff between the PA and Israel and the United States. Now, as elections draw near, the Likud, led by Prime Minister Netanyahu, appears to be starting to worry that the right may soon lose some critical support, because too many parties might split the right-wing vote so much that smaller parties won't make it in at all, and then those votes will be lost. That's why, with polls indicating that they'll both come short of the electoral threshold, Likud is now pressuring both Otsma Yudit and Zahut to back out of the race completely. In fact, Netanyahu's confidant, Nathan Eshel, is already pressuring Utsma Yehudit's Itamar Ben-Gvir to bow out. And as for Zehut, party leader Moshe Feiglin was offered a ministry position if he abandoned his party. Further, Likud allegedly offered to cover Zehut's campaign costs and legalize cannabis, which is an issue that Feiglin has been running on for months. Neither party seems to be taking the bait, though, and they instead plan to stay in the race. Now, why is Likud so desperate to change things now, though? while well, recent polls placed Likud neck and neck with rival party Blue and White. But as it stands now, with both parties nabbing about 30 seats each, neither Netanyahu nor Blue and White's Benny Gantz would be able to form a coalition. And then finally, in another blow to Netanyahu's Central Election Committee chairman, Hanan Melser, announced that volunteers will not be allowed to operate cameras in Arab polling stations as previously thought. This after already doing so in April. Likud hoped to again send thousands of activists into Arab towns to, vote, to monitor voting irregularities. Critics, though, said that the initiative would only foster voter intimidation. A shocking video is breaking the internet right now, and it involves an Israeli. But we're sad to say why. A family on vacation in Thailand was visiting an animal park in Koh Samai when a leopard literally attacked their two-year-old son, Oral Burns. And apparently, it was a family member who actually opened the door to the big cat's enclosure. Yeah, CCTV footage actually shows someone opening the door, and apparently the child's grandfather, to take photos. But once the door was left unattended, the leopard managed to get out, and according to witnesses, he pinned down the young boy. You can imagine the youngster sustained serious injuries to his face, and the whole incident took about eight seconds. Shocked passers-by say that the handlers kicked the leopard in the head and attempted to pull it off of the child and back into its cage. The little Burns was then rushed to a nearby hospital, where he was taken into surgery, and luckily he is reported to be in stable condition. He has now been flown back to Israel as well, where he is receiving additional treatment at the Sheba Hospital. Now, the animal park did cover the medical costs for burns in Thailand. However, the boy's father, Rafi, is now attacking the park, saying that the animal should have been drugged for tourists to take pictures with it, and that there should have been more staff on hand to control the animals. Now, in relation to the traumatic incident in Thailand, where a leopard actually attacked a small Israeli boy, a larger issue comes to mind. Where do we draw the line when it comes to animal rights? Because while many injured or endangered animals cannot be left in the wild, other animals are exploited and abused in captivity, specifically by often drugging the animals so that tourists can get the perfect selfie. Well, joining us now on the phone with some insights on the issue, we have Sophie Ben David, a wildlife rehabilitator from the Israeli Wildlife Hospital in Ramat Gan Safari. Sophie, thank you so much for being with us. Um, for sure, with pleasure. 
So actually, you know, who's at fault here in the Thailand incident? Is it is it, you know, the the grandfather? Is it the the zoo? Like who who do we blame if there is someone to blame? Well, I think it's um, a collective blame. First of all, the um, if it was a zoo that kept the animal, the conditions obviously weren't the best way to keep the wild animal. Um, wild animals in zoos should be not should not be accessible to the public. They should always be under lock and key um, with multiple fences and gates. Even the workers shouldn't be able to have such easy access. In this case, obviously, it's a leopard that could be petted and was probably chained up for most of the time. Um, the family, the man who opened the door, clearly didn't respect the boundaries. And in general, tourists that go to these places and support these um, support the trade of petting wild cats are all at fault as well for continuing to support them and go there. Yeah, and Sophie, I mean, this kind of this case was they opened the door to take a picture, right? So, what are other kinds of abuses that are more, most common with these types of animals? Um, well, all these animals that are these wild cats that are very that are sorry. All these wild animals, these wild cats that you can take pictures with and pet them, they, they've been drugged. They're not in their natural state. They are chained up most of the time. And wow, it's so. not a way to keep a wild animal. Wild animals should be respected and they should be kept just for us to view them in their natural habitat. Or if they're in an enclosure, they should be kept as natural as possible. And to be respected so that they're wild, they can always change. They can even if it looks like a cat that's sleeping, they can always jump out and attack. Okay, so yeah. so coming off of that same uh, response, you know, what are maybe the minimum requirements for humane captivity? So in any self-respecting zoo, the enclosures are large. They the workers also don't have physical touch with the animals. Everything's done with um, behind gates. The workers um, as well, not just guests. Pardon? The workers, workers as well, as well exactly. Yeah. We all respect oh. that the animals are wild and still have the natural instinct to attack. Um, okay, and, is done. and what do you think about the free-range savanna that they're actually opening up in Bercheva in place of a zoo? Is this kind of um, a better way to go with these types of animals? Well, it's similar to the safari. I don't know the Bell Shovel place, but it's similar to the safari in the zoo where you can drive around with your car. These are vegetarian animals which um, are just free-ranging and are quite safe to go around the zoo in the car with, um, around them. Um, other animals, they do need to be kept in enclosures like um, monkeys or um, meat eaters. Also okay. because they are, they can escape more easily, and also for veterinary um, yeah. um, veterinary purposes, them. right? Yeah, All and right. also just the care is better. But they All should right. always be kept in larger enclosures and with the correct conditions for each specific species. Yeah. Okay. Well, Sophie, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I think we'll really have a lot to think about here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no problem. Thank yeah. you. Now, in a world where preventable diseases like tuberculosis still run rampant and can even become resistant to antibiotics, early diagnosis and treatment is key. But a team of Israeli researchers at the Weizmann Institute of Science may have just developed the algorithm necessary to detect and prevent the spread of such illnesses. And their study was published in Nature Communications in, on July 22nd. In general, as lead author in the study, Roy Avraham explains, one of three outcomes typically occurs when a bacterium comes in contact with the immune system. The immune system wins, the infection wins, or the disease goes dormant, sometimes even for good, as is in the case of tuberculosis and similar illnesses. Also, it's thought that the interaction is determined practically as soon as the meeting occurs. So using that knowledge, the team at the Weizmann Institute's Biological Regulation Department tested thousands of interactions between immune cells and salmonella. And by doing this, they were able to find markers that predicted how the disease would behave long term. Then this led to, de to the development of the algorithm to predict the outcome with a simple blood test. But finally, and most importantly, the algorithm seems to have been proven correct. And it was then applied to predict the outcomes in lab-controlled infections using tuberculosis. In fact, according to team member Noah Bossel Ben Moshe, the algorithm can both define the ensemble of immune cells that take part in the body's response, 
and identify the potential strength of the immune response based on its activity. Now, the Israeli company WaterGen has just made headlines time after time for its technology that literally pulls water out of thin air. But now they're garnering attention once again after being selected to bring fresh drinking water to the Chad Basin of Africa, which is facing a crisis that has left millions without water. The Chad Basin is the main water source for the people of Chad, Nigeria, Niger, and Cameroon. But right now, around 30 million people are drinking toxic water. WaterGen's atmospheric water generator apparently has the solution. It not only extracts water from the air, it's also portable, and it only needs one source of power to work. We're talking diesel, electric, or solar, although it at least needs 30% humidity in the air to function. And it really isn't a problem, though, for the humid African region. The machine not only supplies water, but it also purifies it, and has already been installed in other nations that are in need of fresh water, from Sierra Leone to Mexico to Panama and more. And so now, the next step over the next couple of months, charitable organizations will be purchasing one WaterGen unit to begin testing it out for feasibility, maintenance needs, and also income generating possibilities in the region. Now moving on, Tel Aviv is known as having the highest number of startups per capita, but who stands out from the crowd? Well, joining us with the scoop is ILTV's Natasha Kirchuk. All right, today there are an estimated 6,000 startups in Tel Aviv alone, 18 of which are unicorns, but I'm about to break down five of the hottest Tel Aviv startups, according to the leading American magazine Wired. All right, so let's start with Albe Robotics. 90% of car accidents are caused by the driver, which is why this startup that has built a 40 ultra-high resolution imaging radar for cars can differentiate threats from false alarms in real time, meaning your next drive could be a lot safer. Now, Gloat is an Israeli startup that has the potential to really make you smug with pleasure. It's basically a matchmaking platform between individuals and opportunities, like Tinder for finding a job, which allows companies to find candidates in a way that is completely blind to race, gender, ethnicity, or socioeconomic status. And you want to learn how to play the piano finally? Well, check out the Israeli startup Joytunes, which is essentially the Netflix for learning music. They create music learning apps that help people with no experience whatsoever learn how to become music maestros in an engaging and, of course, fun way. And I'll let you know if I learn how to play the guitar by next week. Next up is Zebra Medical Vision, an Israeli AI platform that can accurately interpret medical scans, detect anomalies, and provide a diagnosis on the spot. They've already received FDA clearance for a chest x-ray triage product, which uses machine learning, and it can trigger an automatic alert for a condition that can lead to lung collapse. So the future already looks healthier. Want to make some money while you're shopping? Well, check out the Israeli startup Boom25, a shopping website where every 25th customer gets a full refund on their purchase. It's basically a game to get free stuff. And the startup is already working with 700 retailers, so it's uh, worth taking a look. Last but not least, my friends, Giving Way, the Israeli free social platform where volunteers, donor, donors, and nonprofits can get together to work towards a cause, whether it's healthcare, education, or the environment. It's kind of like matchmaking for donations without any third party intermediaries. And that's how you stand out in Silicon Wadi, Tel Aviv's tech cluster. Back to you guys. Natasha, thank you so much. Now, in other news, 83 year old Israeli sculptress Dina Merchav has just been chosen as one of 46 artists to have their work displayed at the International Desert Sculpture Symposium and Land Art Festival in Minchin County, China. Yeah, and Merchav's installation, Walking 2019, was chosen from a field of more than 2,000 works of art produced by 538 artists from 63 different countries. But her painted iron work stands 720 centimeters, or 23.6 feet tall, and it depicts four red figures walking towards a better world. Quote, a world filled with love rather than aggression, according to Merchav. Also, the opening ceremony in July drew some 40,000 people to the Suu Desert to view and photograph the artworks, 23 of which were by Chinese artists, while the other 23 were by foreign sculptors. Additionally, Merchav remarked how remarkable it was to see Chinese people so interested and invested in culture in general and sculpture in particular. Likewise, at the unveiling, Merchav, who is a graduate of Jerusalem's Bezalel Art Academy, gave a short speech about the importance of outdoor sculpture on people's well-being and productivity. Merchav is a resident of Ein Hod Artists Colony in Israel's Carmel region, and her installations have been displayed in a number of countries in the past as well, including China and at the Beijing Olympic Park. Now let's take a look at the weather forecast. 
Tonight will be partly cloudy and hot with a low of 78 or 26 degrees Celsius. And tomorrow is expected to be more of the same with a high of 88 or 31 degrees Celsius. All right, that's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.52 shekels to the American dollar. For more news from ILTV, please subscribe to ILTV on Facebook and Instagram. I'm Aaron Porras. And I'm Nittany Manson. Thank you so much for watching.